and worship with us. You are 
Cross Point Church. I love water baptisms. This morning we're going to baptize Jackson Smith. And for those of you who are new to our church or you've not been here when we've done a baptism, we just want you to know how things happen. So I'm going to say, Jackson, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's going to go under the water. And when he comes back up, you guys are going to absolutely lose your minds in celebration. So let's practice that. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jackson, have you committed your heart to Jesus? Yes. Do you promise to live for him all of your days? Yes. Step up just a little bit. There you go. Jackson, because of your public profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship the Lord this morning. be 
church and to be singing praise to our Father. Before I share what God's put on my heart, I feel led by the Spirit just to say welcome. It's your first time in church ever. It's your first time here. If you think, man, there's no way that God can accept you and receive you, I just want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. And your Father in heaven is glad you're here. Amen. Hey guys, I'm excited. I, what I feel led to share this morning is a prayer that Paul prayed in the scripture. So as I read it, let the words from Ephesians, let the words that give life, that are living and active, let them pour over your heart, soak them up, and hear the prayer that Paul prays for us from Ephesians chapter 3. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. I love glorious, unlimited resources, our, our Father in heaven. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. And don't we want Christ living in our hearts? Trust him every day. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. I love that phrase. May our roots grow down deep into God's love and keep us strong. And may, church, all of us have the power to understand, as God's people should, how wide, how high, how long, and how deep His love is. Think about that for a second. Not because of something you or I did, because that's who God is. How high and how wide and how deep and how long. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Written by the man who met Jesus on the road. Met Jesus, repented, and began to share that good news. I love that phrase. May we experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Life is only found in God, amen? And I'm only at the middle age part of this life, I hope, unless Jesus comes back. Some of you have a lot more wisdom to know that there's only one source of life. It's in God. So here's what's cool. Paul writes that prayer as he's reflecting because the start of it says, when I think of all this, you know what he's thinking about, church? He's thinking about that God's mysterious plan has been revealed. That's what he talks about earlier in the chapter, that salvation has come to Jew and Gentile alike. That's you and me. It's not hidden anymore. Salvation has come through Jesus Christ to Jews and Gentiles. That's us. So here's what I want to ask us, church. Sometime this week, turn off every screen in your house. Go to a place where you're alone and simply get on your knees and reflect on the salvation that God has given you and me through Jesus Christ. Turn off every screen and go to a place where you can be alone for two minutes or two hours and simply thank our Father in heaven for that salvation that we've been given. Amen? And if you're here and you don't know this God we talk about, if you have not repented and given your life to Jesus Christ, it's not a mystery anymore. That salvation's for you too. And you can't earn it. Make today the day that you receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's also pray just like Paul did. Let's pray for the country of Jordan. Eight million people. And I told the first service, sometimes I read these numbers and I feel like I don't reflect or they don't hit me, but today, think about 3.4 million people have never heard the name of Jesus. So as you go to that place of quiet this week, I was struck as I prepared that why, why would God allow me to know him? There are 3.4 million people that have never heard the name of Jesus. 
So as you reflect and as you praise and as you worship in your quiet, let that propel you to share his love with people in our community and beyond that don't know him. Amen? And let's pray for believers, very few, 0.3%, that they may stand firm in opposition that we can't even understand. God is good. Amen? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. We have hearts that are open to you. Father, and as I've reflected this summer on your goodness through the generations in my own family, and the grace that you've poured out on me and others in my family, thank you for this church family, Father. And may we all reflect on your goodness to us, the salvation that you have given us that's a gift. Draw us to quiet this week and to praise and worship and propel us, empower us, Holy Spirit, to share that good news in our community and beyond. And Lord, we lift up the country of Jordan. We pray for salvation to come to individuals, leaders, people who are so far from you or so we would think it would be radically transformed just like you did Paul and Lord we pray for believers to stand firm as they face challenge and opposition give them the courage give them boldness provide for their very needs as they serve you in that country and Lord I pray for those here who don't hearts be open today to receive, to repent, and to come to know you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. Welcome somebody to church. Say hi, give my high five. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to say it again. Good morning, everybody. So glad that you're here. What an exciting morning already, baptizing Jackson this morning. Let's give it up for him again. So proud of him. I told him out there, I said, Jackson, I'm expecting great things from you. I also want to just extend a congratulations to Tyler and Madison Metcalf for the very first time. Where are you at? They're in church right here. Got married last night in church today. That's worth celebrating right there. Congratulations. We're proud of you guys. Well, we get to continue to worship the Lord this morning. And one way that we get to worship the Lord is through our regular Sunday morning tithes and offering. If it's your first time here this morning, we're not asking that you would give or contribute. This service is our gift to you. But if you're a regular attender and you're stepping out in obedience and doing what God has asked you to do with your tithes and offerings, there are three different ways that you can give. One is by grabbing the offering envelope in the seat fast pocket in front of you, filling that out, cash check, inserting that, dropping it out as the host come. Another way is by going to crosspointwaverly.com. And the third way is to text to give, which is up on the screen. Let's pray before the host come this morning. God, we thank you for the ability to worship you, to give back to you a portion of what you've already given to us. And so Lord, I pray this morning as people step in on, out in obedience, to do what you've asked us to do, that you would bless them, that you would take this offering, multiply it for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Host, would you come? As the hosts are coming to collect the offering, we'd like for you to turn your attention to the screen. One of our small groups that will be happening this fall is Financial Peace University. See, this whole idea of living without debt, it requires a completely new way of looking at things.
The Bible says, be not conformed to this world. And you don't want to be normal. Because normal's broke. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Right? The number one cause of divorce is money fights. You don't want to be normal. Normal's broke. I had done some stupid stuff with money. church how many of you are broke your brokenness is welcome here <laughs> I'm so glad you chose to worship with us today if it's your first time here there's cards in the seat in front of you if you'll fill those out and meet me uh, in the reception area after church I'll have a gift for you and let you know a little bit more about our church um, as always, you can ask questions or you can attend a growth track, which is where you meet with Pastor Dan. Um, he'll tell you about our church and the history of our church. You'll find out what your giftings may be and see where you can plug in and be of service to our church family. Well, today after church, we have a farewell cupcake reception for Pastor Levinsky and Mackenzie right after service. So be prepared to give hugs and shed some tears. Um, we've got first graders transitioning into big kids church, and that's a big deal. They love it when they get to go to big kids church. So that will be on the 25th. And while I'm thinking about that, you know, school starts this Friday. Let's be praying for our kiddos and their teachers as they go back to school this week. God bless those teachers. We've got sisterhood coming up, and uh, sisterhood is for every woman in this church, whether you're young or old, whether you've met God before or you're just getting introduced to him. We want you to come and get plugged in with a group of some great ladies, and uh, that's starting up. We also have a day of caring coming up, um, kicking off fall activities, and the whole community is participating in this, and uh, we are partnering with uh, the United Way and the Excel group, and we'll have a day of service, so put that on your calendar. Um, we also have kids ministries coming back on the 11th and some changes with leadership and stuff. So be praying for those leaders and pray that your kids want to come. Pray that they'll bring their friends and that they'll discover God in amazing ways while they're young so that they don't have to go through the brokenness that some of us have had to go through. So that's starting the 11th. Small groups start back up the 15th. Financial peace is one of them. So everything you need to know, you can find at crosspointwaverly.com or come to the reception desk afterwards and we'll make sure that we get you that information. God bless you. weeks ago, we began a new sermon series called The Switch. And we've looked at the call of God over the last four weeks, and this morning we're going to wrap up the series. If you've missed any of these messages, I would encourage you to listen online at crosspointwaverly.com. There are people who live their entire lives without realizing that God has created them for a purpose and has a plan for their life. My hope is that through this series that you've discovered that God does have a purpose and a plan for your life. And not only that you've discovered it, but that you've begun to take those next steps to walk in the plan and the purpose that he has for you. Here at our church, we have an opportunity called Growth Track. And so for those of you who are like, you know what, I, I love God, but I don't know what the purpose or the plan is that he has for my life, but I'd like to discover that. Growth Track is an opportunity for you to discover your giftings and your talents. Pastor Dan has an assessment that he offers through that. We'd encourage each of you to go through it and discover what it is that God has for you. We can look throughout history and identify some people who've made a significant impact for the kingdom of God because they've lived out the calling that God had for them. Our Christian faith is one of action. Lofty dreams without action are just that. They're just lofty dreams. And our Christian faith should not just be uh, something of inaction, but it should be a faith of action. And so I would encourage each of us to take the dreams that God has given to us and live those out. 
And I encourage us to dream God-sized dreams. As we dream God-sized dreams with Holy Spirit-anointed people, we'll make a tremendous impact for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God needs less of us talking about our faith and more of us acting out our faith. Amen? So as we look at the Bible, there are a number of characters that we can look at when it comes to the call of God. This morning, we're going to look back at a couple of people. One would be Moses and the other would be David. As we look at Moses and David's life, they have their God-given purpose, but it's not immediately revealed to everyone or to them. The same can be true for us, that as we step out in the calling that God's placed upon our lives, he doesn't reveal to us the end destination. Instead, as we take a step, then he reveals the next step, and we continue to walk with that plan and that purpose that he has for us. We can't allow our insecurities and place in life to keep us from our God-given purpose to serve him and to serve others. Before we dive into the scriptures this morning, I, I want to share about a man who made a huge kingdom impact. He preached to millions of people on a daily basis, but his platform was non-traditional. His ministry was unconventional, but my guess is that when I say his name, most of you will know who I'm talking about. How many of you know Mr. Rogers? Okay, let me ask it this way. How many of you do not know Mr. Rogers? Okay, a few of you. And it just shows your age, really. Pastor Levinsky raised his hand in first service. I said, you're fired. After today, you're out of here. How can you not know who Mr. Rogers is? At the beginning of the year, we, we started the year off by talking about the importance and the value of the Bible. And so every single Sunday, I've said this to you, and I will say it maybe for the rest of my life. And so we value the Bible. We encourage you to be engaging with the Bible outside of a Sunday morning experience. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. Technology has increased our access to the Bible. There's a free app on the uh, on any digital device called the Bible app. And so uh, if you haven't downloaded it, I would encourage you to download it. Life Church put that out a number of years ago. They were innovative with it. And there are a ton of Bible studies that are on there. And so you can search for free. There are different, not Bible studies, excuse me, devotionals. So there are a ton of different devotionals that you can look at. And I came across this devotional about Mr. Rogers. And so in the YouVersion Bible study, this one is called Fred Rogers and the Call to Create. And so I just want to share some of that devotional with you this morning because I believe that some of you will find yourself in a similar situation. Not all of us are called to stand up and preach the word of God on a Sunday morning. Not all of us are called to stand up and lead and worship, but God has a calling upon all of us. And here's what I know is that if you limit the call of God to the men and the women who stand up here to publicly proclaim the gospel, then we won't make near the impact that God wants us to make on this community and for his kingdom. Okay, we all have a purpose, and as a body of Christ, as each of us do what God has asked us to do, then a difference will be made. And so here's, here's what it said about Mr. Rogers. Long before he zipped up a cardigan sweater and became Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers was a young man who loved Jesus and was eager to discover his calling. Throughout his childhood and adolescence, Rogers had many interests and talents, including music, puppetry, and children's education. The question in Roger's mind was how he could combine these different gifts in a single opportunity to best serve others. Dr. June Lee Lee, the former co-director of the Fred Rogers Center, explains that Fred was guided by a deep sense of service, of wanting to be useful to the world. He was driven by service, even if in his mind it was vague for years as to how to best leverage his considerable talents in service for others. Fred Rogers embodied Romans chapter 12 where Paul writes, uh, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. This is your reasonable act of worship. And so Fred Rogers understood this and is deep, deeply understanding that as Christians, the gospel of Jesus' selfless sacrifice should compel us to view our whole lives as service to others. When it comes to our work, the proper response to the gospel is not to seek out the work that will earn us the most fame and fortune. The goal should be to find the work that we can do most exceptionally well in service of God and others. In the words of Rogers himself, you don't set out to be rich and famous, you set out to be helpful. As Rogers' biographer points out, this relentless sense of service to God drove every moment of Fred Rogers' life, especially in how he thought about his work. But how would he serve? 
Where was Rogers being called to put his gifts to work for the glory of God and the good of others? These were the questions that Rogers grappled with for many years. And I imagine that some of you are wrestling with that same tension of what do you do with the giftings that God has given to you? Rogers had a term that he loved to use when referring to discerning one's calling. He called it a guided drift. The idea that while it is good and wise to make plans, one, in, one needed to live a life that was open to change, led by the Holy Spirit. So as Rogers was wrapping up college in the spring of 1951, he was planning a career in pastoral ministry, as this was how he thought that he could be of utmost service to others. But just before starting seminary, Rogers saw television for the very first time. Imagine that. My generation probably saw the television in the hospital room when we were born. But he saw the television for the very first time, and he was intrigued by a vision of what he had had, and the medium of television could be redeemed and used for good, particularly in demonstrating Christ-like character to children. Not only that, but in television, Roger saw an opportunity to channel all of his varied gifts in a single direction. And so I said to my parents, you know, I don't think I'm going to go to seminary right away. I think I'll maybe go into television. That's what Roger said. I wonder how his parents responded in that moment. Like, once you get a real job, son, I hope it works out for you. Hopefully they were people of faith and believed that what God was speaking to his heart. But for Rogers, the decision to commit to a career in television was a relatively easy one, as he felt that's where he could be of the utmost service to his quote-unquote neighbors. And in the mind of Fred Rogers, there was no divide between the sacred and the secular. He understood that man's first calling in the garden was to emulate the creator father by creating new things. And that the path to having the greatest cultural impact for the gospel is often found in embracing the call to create. So Fred Rogers was called to create as a means of influencing culture with the Christian values he held so dear. Later in his career, Rogers said, no matter what our particular job, especially in the world today, we are called to be ticken olam, repairers of creation. The devotion went on to say whether you're called to create a TV show, a book, a business, or a new process at work, the fact is is that all of us have been called to be repairers of creation, influencing culture for the sake of the gospel. Let us all learn from Fred Rogers' example and allow that God-given calling to change the way that we think about why we work, what we create, and how we live out our vocations. I want us to turn in our Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 3. If you're new to the Bible or if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat basket in front of you. We'd encourage you to take it. It's our gift to you. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. So honestly, you're just going to turn a few pages in and you should find it. It's right after Genesis. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for your word and for the power that it has to transform our lives. We ask that over the next few moments that we would sense a demonstration of your spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at this passage, we can see that Moses thought that he couldn't. But God knew that he could. And oftentimes when we look at the calling that God has placed upon our lives, we can say we can't. But we've got to recognize that he can. God and Moses have this exchange in this passage. And basically Moses tells God that he can't do it. And God responds with, yeah, I know that. That's why I'm going to do it through you instead. And so God told Moses, but I will be with you. God can take what we see as an excuse and use it for his good. He can take our insecurities and shortcomings and use them to make him known even more. 
Sometimes in life, just the power of knowing who's on our side can change our mentality. I know that my dad was gifted with the ability to fix anything, whether it's mechanically or whatever, he can build anything. Those genes did not pass on to me. So I'm grateful for him. Even today, there are things where I'll call him, or, and when he's helping me, then it lends all kinds of confidence to me, and I know that I can get it done. This past week, Jacob's truck wasn't running right. And so I shared the symptoms with some friends of mine, and they said, it sounds like the fuel pump is going out. I'm like, great. So I call a few shops around town and ask them, hey, per se, in a 2004 Chevy Silverado, if the fuel pump is out, could you work on it? And they said, well, we're out two to three weeks. Okay, well, that's not helpful. So I got in touch with one shop and told them the the problem, and they said, "Uh, we can get it in at the beginning of the week. And I said, great. So How much would that cost if that's the deal? And she goes, give me a few minutes. And then she comes back on the phone and says, it would only be $997. Are you kidding me? A thousand bucks to fix fix this truck? I felt so helpless in that moment. I called a friend of mine and asked uh, and, and told him what was going on. And he said, is the check engine light on? I said, is it supposed to go off? I thought that was a feature on the truck. (laughs) So we got the codes read, and uh, I called uh, called this friend back and told him what the codes were, and he said, you know what, it sounds like it could be a coolant sensor, which is $20. It's easy to change. Get the coolant sensor and try to change it out and see if that fixes it. So I go to the repair store. I tell them the model of the truck. They give me this part. I take it home. Jacob and I open up the hood and find it. And yeah, and Tom Wheeler's laughing at me right now. It's okay. Pop the hood, find the part, pull the part off, and grab the new part to stick it in. And all of a sudden, my hands let go of the part. And it falls to where I can't reach it from the top, and I can't reach it from the bottom. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Did you say a dirty word? <laughs> no, but I thought some. So Jacob, miraculously, is able to get that part out, and so I try to stick it back in the place again, and it's not going, and so then I compare the old one with the new one and realize that the new one is smaller than the old one. That's why it's not working. And so, but before I could get the the old one off, uh, my friend told me, you need a 17-millimeter wrench. So you know what my set goes up to? 16 millimeters. That's right. We got it all figured out. I told Jacob, I said, son, this is why you need to get a good paying job so you can pay someone to do this. We got the new part put in. We started up the truck, and miraculously, it worked, and it's running well. So uh, just pray that his truck continues to run good. Seriously, for a mechanically inclined person, that project would have taken maybe 20 minutes. I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took us, so I'm not even going to say. But it took forever. But here's the deal. He and I had been watching YouTube videos to see the best of how we could do it, and it took us longer, and it was clunkier than it needed to be. Here's what I believe can happen when it comes to our calling from God. See, Jacob in this moment leaned into me to help me fix his truck. That was his first problem. I wasn't given much strength. Secondly, we leaned in. To YouTube. And there are some of you that are looking at the call of God that's been placed upon your life, and you're asking people about the call that God has placed on your life from people who don't have the first clue about what the call of God should look like in your life. Secondly, there are some of you who are watching the proverbial YouTube videos, and you're trying to mimic and act like and think that the calling that he's placed on your life is supposed to look like this, when in the reality, God's given a specific anointing for this person to do that, and he's given an anointing, a specific anointing for you to do this. And so when we try to do what someone else is doing, then it's clunkier, and it takes us longer to get there, and the results aren't near as good as if we'll just do what God is calling and asking us to do. You need to get with the creator, the one who designed you and designed a unique purpose for you to fill. This leads us to the next person that we're going to look at. I encourage you to turn over to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see the story of a man named David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 7, 
God gave some instructions to Samuel on how to find and anoint the next king. In verse number seven, it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Many of you know the story of David. He wasn't the oldest. He wasn't the strongest of all of his brothers. When Samuel came to his house to anoint one of Jesse's son, sons, Jesse didn't even bother to bring David in from the field. His own dad overlooked him. And I just want to say to you this morning that being overlooked doesn't make you a failure. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at that outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. And maybe others don't notice you or think that you're capable or worthy, but God notices you. And he's made you worthy through the sacrifice of the cross. David was overlooked in the field, but he would later be remembered when Samuel couldn't find God's man to become king among his brothers. And just because you don't feel gifted or you've been overlooked by others doesn't mean that you aren't valued and purposed by God. God has you exactly where he wants you to be. And when he's ready to move you on, then the door will open for you to move to that next place. And so what do you feel, what do you do when you feel like you're being overlooked? You keep going. You keep trying. You keep doing what you're doing with excellence. How many know that each morning when we wake up, there's a new page that's being written of our stories? And I just want to say to you this morning, don't let the current page dictate the rest of your story. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see the famous battle of David and Goliath. One day, David's out being forgotten by his dad and by his brothers. And the next day, David is the most courageous person out on the battlefield. David's years of anonymity was his preparation for what would come next. And in that time, his integrity was being solidified and his skills were being honed. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 34, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. David was a man's man. He said when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb, he would chase after it and beat it until it released the lamb. The next line, he says, and if the bear or the lion had the audacity to think that it was going to turn on me, then I would grab it by the beard and beat it to death. We just read that. Read it again in the passage if you don't believe me. I wonder what is God preparing you for? The place you work the people who are around you, the situation you may be in may not seem ideal, but don't let it stop you from making a difference. I wonder, do circumstances in your life make it feel impossible? David recognized that God was with him. Moses recognized that God was with him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, David asked this question. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, when he walked up and saw everyone cowering to Goliath, he basically said, what's up with this? Why are you letting him intimidating, intimidate you? Are you forgetting who your God is? Why are you letting the giant appear bigger than your God? Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that you're done. God can rescue you and use you. The race isn't finished yet. A lot can change. Momentum can shift. I'm not a big sports fan, many of you know that about me, but anyone who watches sports knows that the game's not over until it's over. Momentum shifts. Teammates get injured. And when that happens, the outcomes can change. There are times in individual sports where people can self-sabotage themselves. This last week, my father-in-law was in our house. He's a tennis fan. He had tennis on the television, which I think was the first time in our house that tennis has ever been on the television. I don't know much about tennis. They just hit it back from side to side, but I can see the score. And so this guy is winning, 
And then all of a sudden, he starts crying and whining after every play. After every play, he'll bark at the ref, and then he'll go back and serve it, bark at the ref again. How many of you have seen players do this? Okay, he was ahead, and then all of a sudden, this got in his head, and he wound up losing the day because of all of that. So momentum can shift. Things can change. And the same is true for us. You might be down, but you're not out. The race isn't finished yet. And just because you're where you are now doesn't mean that that's where you'll always be. You may feel defeated today, but I'm telling you, if you've still got breath in you, then you're not defeated. The devil has not won, and he's not going to. Someone needs to hear that this morning. If you've got breath in your lungs today, the devil has not won, and he's not going to win. The final thing that we see with David's life is this. Don't despise how God has designed you. Don't despise how God has designed you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 38, it says, Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. David had a shepherd's bag to face the giant. He tried the other armor, but it wasn't him. The other armor didn't fit. and He couldn't fight the giant in Saul's armor. God's not worried about what you don't have. He wants to use what he's given you. That's how God works. So don't despise how he's created you. I'm telling you, I'm preaching this to myself. My wife knows that I am acutely aware of my weaknesses, and I wish that those weaknesses weren't a strength, but the reality is, is the ministry that I have today is not built off my weeks, it's built off of my strengths. And if I try to be someone who I'm not, then God's not going to continue to bless what he's doing in me. And so someone needs to hear that this morning. God's not worried about what you don't have, he wants to use what he has given you for his glory. So maybe some of you don't feel usable, but God says that you are. Don't let what others say about you change what God does with you. Many miss God's best because they're believing the worst things that have been said about them. I pray this morning that some of you would get the, the, the lies of the enemy out of your ears and that you would begin to hear and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your lives. Sometimes denying others' expectations and stepping into your calling is the most important step. Others felt like David was at a disadvantage. I'm going to ask that the worship team comes up as I conclude this morning. Some thought that David didn't stand a chance because he didn't come prepared the same way that those around him came. That if David would have tried to do like them, then he might not have been successful. David knew his strengths. He didn't let what he didn't have keep him from doing what God wanted him to do. There's an author named Malcolm Gladwell that wrote a book called David and Goliath, and he takes the famous story of the Bible and puts some leadership principles to it. It's not a a Christian book, but it's worth reading. And in it, he says that we often paint David as the underdog in the story. But he said anybody anybody who has studied war history understands that someone with a slingshot is at a greater advantage than someone with a sword and a shield. David was able from a distance to be able to slay the giant. I just want to say this morning, don't allow your insecurities in place in life keep you from your God-given purpose to serve him and to serve others. It's interesting that the thing that others thought that David needed in that moment, he didn't need. Goliath came against David with with a sword and a spear. As you know the rest of the story, David took the very sword that was meant to slay him from Goliath. And he used it to chop Goliath's head off. I wonder where you are in your life right now. And where you would like to be. As you think about your current situation, as as you dream about your preferred future, what's the difference? What are the steps that you need to take and what can you be doing now to be used by God? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room? Maybe there are some of you who've come in this morning, you don't have a relationship with God and you say, today I want to enter into a relationship with Him. Maybe there are others of you that have come in and you've turned your back on Him and you say, today I need to see my relationship restored back to Him. 
Here's what I believe is from the very beginning of this service that the Holy Spirit has been tugging at some of your hearts. Doug at the end of worship came up and he prayed and he talked about and he prayed that at this moment there would be some of you who would respond to give, Je to give your hearts to Jesus this morning. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, that's me, today I need to ask Jesus to come into my life for the very first time. Or you say, I need to see my relationship restored back to him. When I count to three, why don't you slip up your hands all across this room. One, two, three. Lift them up all across this room. Thank you. I see that hand. One, two, three, four. Are there others this morning? You can put them down. Thank you. I see that hand. Five. Are there others this morning? Six. I see that hand. Thank you. Are there others? Let's stand all across this room. There were at least six hands that went up this morning of people who need to ask Jesus to come into their life for the very first time or who need to see their relationship restored back to him. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you raise your hand, I want you to repeat it after me and mean it with everything that's within you. But know that you won't be praying this prayer alone, but that each of us in support of you will also be praying. Let's pray. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've messed up. This morning I ask for your forgiveness. Come and give me a fresh start. Be my savior. Be my king. Take over every area. Take over every aspect. And help me from this day forward to live for you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise for what he's done this morning. Listen, if you raise your hand this morning, we're so proud of you. We want to be able to encourage you along in that journey. And so there's a slide that's about to appear on the screen here. And you can text, I decided to, C, excuse me, text CPC decided to 77948. CPC decided to 77948. If you prefer, there's a paper, piece of paper that says I decided card in front of the, whatever, it's in front of you. Fill it out and give it to a host on your way out. But do this way. So we love you. We're proud of you. I want to pray for us. Pray that this word would settle into our spirits deeply this morning. And then we have another thing that we want to do this morning before we dismiss. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I believe with all of my heart that your Holy Spirit has been speaking to people throughout this entire service. So God, I pray for those that are just now realizing that you have a purpose and a plan for their life, that they would have the courage to take the next step, that they wouldn't just be dreamers, that they just wouldn't think about and process something, but they would take the next step in obedience and doing what you called and asked them to do. Lord, I pray for those this morning that have been allowing what they don't have to keep them from doing what you've called them to do. God, I pray that they would resist the lies of the devil this morning and recognize today from your word that it doesn't matter what they don't have, but instead it matters what they do have and that you want to use that for your glory. So Lord, I pray that you would anoint each of us. And God, I ask that it's each of us use the giftings and the talents and abilities that you've given to us that you would anoint us in such a way that it would bring you glory and that we would make a lasting impact. God, I pray for those in this room that have a similar story to Mr. Rogers, that they think about life, the giftings that you've given to them, and they, they want to serve you, but they don't know quite where to do that. God, I pray that you would birth creativity in the minds of those in this room like you did for Fred Rogers, that they would do things in an unconventional way to leave a greater and a more lasting impact than we could have ever thought in any other way. So God, we pray that you would bless your church. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to sit down for just a moment. And I'm going to ask Pastor Levinsky and Mackenzie to come up here towards the front of the stage with me. As you know, today is their last Sunday, and I'm hopeful that I got all of my cries out in the first service. Someone said, I couldn't believe you cried in the second service four weeks ago when you made the announcement you were calm and collective. I said four weeks ago I was mad. Today I'm sad. Honestly, we love you guys. We're so grateful for you. I'm so grateful that just over four years ago you guys accepted the call 
You stepped out in faith. You moved from sunny Florida to snowy Iowa. And you've made a huge and a lasting impact in our church. As I look out at this congregation this morning, there are a number of you that are here because of Pastor Levinsky. As I look at the stage this morning, there are some of you that, that Pastor Levinsky saw talent in. And he called you out and he's raised up the level of worship that we have in our church. And for that, I want to say thank you. You've blessed my life tremendously. It's been a blessing, man, each week to come in and see your face. This morning, as, as you guys showed up early and you set up and you prepared for today, it was, it was surreal. But honestly, we've been grateful to God for you for the last four years. As hard as it is for me to say it, I'm grateful that you're still willing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that when He's asking you to step out in faith, that you'll go and do what He's asked you to do. So know that you're going to be missed here. That you've got a family of friends that absolutely love you. They'll be praying for you. And we're believing that for you guys, that your best days are ahead. And we believe for our church, that our best days are ahead. In just a moment, the hosts are going to come, and these guys have served honorably over the last four years. They've invested in each one of us. And so as a token of our appreciation this morning, we want to bless them. And so we're going to take up an offering for them. And just as in the regular tithes and offerings, there are three ways to give. You can give cash or check, make the checks payable to Cross Point Church. Everything that comes in in this offering will go to them. You can text to give, or you can give online for them. And so we want to bless them as we send them off. I want to say to you, thanks for your investment, not only in our church as a whole, but with the worship team. But with the youth as well. Thanks for your investment in all of the teenagers, but especially my two. Jacob and Juliana won't be the same because of your investment. So as a dad, as a pastor, I say thank you. So Jacob and Wes have prepared a presentation for you. They have a gift for you. Well, we just wanted to say thank you guys for all you do for the church, for the youth group, and for us, and how you've led us, how God wants us to be, and you showed us what a true example of Jesus would be. flowers for you. Oh, you don't, yeah, here, Jacob, why don't y'all, Wes, will you set those back there? Because they got to lead us in some more worship. So y'all get ready to lead us in worship. And as they're getting ready for that, we're going to, they've, Jacob and Wes have prepared a presentation and the hosts are going to come to collect the offering. So the story behind that last slide is that Pastor Levinsky hosted a camp out in his backyard. So Jacob and Wes put together this slide and it says, till we see you again soon. So if you see some hitchhikers with some tents going to Clinton, Iowa, you know what that's all about.
some of you have asked what we're going to do in the meantime. And I'm so just grateful to God for the talent that he's given to our church. And so for the worship side of things, I've asked Fisher to lead the worship band. He's already been doing that. Some of you see that microphone in front of him. He's never sang in front of that microphone. Instead, he's directing the band behind the scenes. He's already been doing that. We're grateful for it. You've done a great job. And so I've asked him to step up to do that. We'll lean into the, the quality volunteers that Pastor Levinsky has raised up for uh, leading out in the songs. And worship's not going to miss a beat. It's still going to be tremendous and move forward. The other thing that I've asked is for the youth ministry. I've asked Clint Wickham to lead the preaching side of the youth ministry on Wednesday nights in the interim. I've asked Nick Keith to lead the organ. Yeah, you can clap for him if you want to. Yep. So what we're trying to do with the youth ministry in the interim is divide it up into manageable pieces because we don't want the youth ministry to take a step back. Instead, we believe, like I said earlier, that the best days are ahead. So Clint's going to uh, lead the preaching side of it. I've asked Fisher to lead the service side of it. So uh, everything from the start of the service to the end of the service will be under his leadership. And he'll do a great job of that on Sundays and on Wednesdays. And the final thing is I've asked Nick Keith to lead the organizational side of youth ministry. So from start to finish of what takes place with youth ministry, I've asked him to step up and lead that piece of it. Let's give a hand to all three of them for their willingness to do it. Here's what I want us to do. Let's all stand. And I want us to stretch out our hands towards Pastor Levinsky and McKenzie. And I just want to pray a prayer of special blessing over them. Lord, we thank you so much for Pastor Levinsky and for McKenzie, for the blessing that they've been to our church and to me personally. Lord, I'm grateful for your willingness to call them here four years ago. And Lord, we pray that as they take this step of faith, as they transition into the next assignment that you've called them, Lord, we pray that the anointing that you've placed upon them will continue to increase. We pray for an increased season of favor upon their life and blessing. God, we thank you that their house sold quickly. We thank you that you've given them a new house to live in in Clinton and that those things have already been arranged. But God, we pray that as they take this next step, that you would surround them with godly people. Lord, that you would put them in close proximity with some tremendous friends that would encourage them along in their race of faith. And Lord, we pray that in the same way that you've led them to give a tremendous impact in our church, God, we pray that as they step into that congregation next Saturday night and next Sunday morning, that they would experience the presence of the Holy Spirit like never before at River Church, that through their leadership, that people would go to the next level in worship. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to bless them and use them. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, man. Oh. Love you, lady. You are the best. You are the best. So we prepared a cupcake reception for them. So as soon as you walk out these doors, I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and head out that direction. Yep, thank you. So when you leave this morning, you'll just go out these doors and in that gathering area, we have cupcakes galore for everybody. And you're wondering, are they delicious? Yes, uh, they are delicious. So you wanna make sure to grab one this morning, hug their neck, let them know how much of an impact that they've had on your lives this morning. And we'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless you.